A crevasse is a deep open crack, particularly in a glacier. It is one of the most deadly obstacles in mountaineering. Climbers not only plan their routes to avoid crevasses, they also train on getting out and set up their gear specifically so if a person falls in, the others don't and can assist the person that fell. The following story is of two climbers that fell into a crevasse on Mount McKinley in 1981 and their battle for survival. This is the Mount McKinley disaster. In the spring of 1981, Jim Wickwire and Chris Karabrock scheduled a climb on Mount McKinley's North Face. They had plans to climb Mount Everest in the fall of 1982, and this climb of Mount McKinley was not only strategically selected to prepare for Everest, it was also a route that no one had ever attempted. So they could kill two birds with one stone, work on their climbing process in preparation for Everest, and lay out a new route on McKinley's treacherous Wickersham Wall of the North Face. Jim Wickwire was the older of the two at 41. Though both were experienced climbers, he was also much more experienced than Chris. At this time, he had already achieved much in the mountaineering world and was well known. Jim had accomplished many firsts in climbing, including the East Rib of Willis Wall on Mount Rainier and the first winter ascent of Willis Wall. He was also the first American to summit K2 on September 6, 1978, where he lingered on the summit a little bit too long and had a now famous treacherous descent. Chris Karabrock was only 25 and much less experienced, but was an expert climber in his own right. Both were members of a Seattle-based expedition that was planning to climb Everest in 1982. Both men were extremely talented and experienced climbers that were not in over their heads when it came to the extreme challenge that McKinley posed. Mount McKinley, currently known as Denali, poses an extreme climbing risk. McKinley is the tallest mountain in North America standing at 20,310 feet above sea level. Though this mountain is nearly 9,000 feet lower than Everest, the prominence, the height from the base to the summit, is approximately 18,000 feet, making McKinley the tallest mountain from base to peak. This presents a huge climbing obstacle. To test their skills and train together, Jim and Chris decided to tackle the Wickersham Wall. This wall rises as a steady steep slope from an ice fall at 5,000 feet up to 15,000 feet. The Wickersham Wall is on the isolated north side of McKinley. The wall is not as steep as other difficult climbs, but this face is known to have deadly avalanches, crevasses, and seracs. In 1963, two routes were completed on this wall, one being on the left side of the wall and being fairly low in technical difficulty, and the second being on the right side of the wall, again not extremely technically difficult. However, these teams provided vast amounts of photos and information about the wall that Jim and Chris poured over. From this information, they were able to decide on a new route that no one had ever attempted. The route that they had planned was up the central portion of the wall, where there were plenty of stopping and planning points mixed in with extreme dangerous crevasses and clear avalanche zones that they would need to avoid. On May 2nd, 1981, they registered at Talkeetna Ranger Station and began their ascent, not up the north face, but on the opposite side of the mountain. Their plan was to not only summit the North Peak, but when that was done, the extremely confident duo planned to traverse over to and also summit the South Peak, then descend the West Buttress from Denali Pass. Therefore, they wanted to begin their ascent from the same side. They began their ascent on the Kahiltna Pass side and camped just below Kahiltna Pass. The next day, on Friday, May 8th, 1981, they traversed Cahiltna Pass and made their way through crevasses and Bertrands to Peters Glacier. At this point, they had one sled. They previously had two, but decided to load enough equipment and food for their climb onto one relatively heavily loaded sled. This tied the two men together with a single sled that put them in close proximity. Their plan was to camp on Peters Glacier near Jeffrey Point until weather conditions on the wall were what they wanted. However, as they crossed Peters Glacier, they came across crevasse after crevasse, making their way slow and treacherous. They progressed very carefully and slowly. For the most part, they could see nearly every crevasse as they were either open or the snow sagged, leaving a telltale sign of the danger beneath. Even so, they checked every step and made sure that the snow and ice under their feet was solid before moving forward. 
Furthermore, the glacier surface was extremely uneven, causing the sled to tip over again and again. They got into a routine of Chris, who was leading, pulling on the sled as Jim, who was behind the sled, tipping it back up onto its rails. The unintended consequence of this is that the men were closer together than they normally would be while climbing. Eventually, the pair saw a smooth incline that appeared to have no difficulties. This would give them a well-needed break from the exhausting terrain. They were able to move much more quickly now across this smooth surface. Then, in the words of Jim Wickwire, without any warning whatsoever, I am flying through the air. Chris had fallen into a crevasse with the sled following, then Jim, all tied together with no space between them to prepare or provide relief, both Chris and Jim were falling into the crevasse. When Jim came to, he was on top of the sled, and the sled was on top of Chris. Jim looked up through the crevasse to see a small sliver of the sky through an opening 25 feet above him. Where Jim was, the crevasse was only 18 inches wide, and as one became deeper into the crevasse, it narrowed. That's where Chris was. Chris fell in first, the sled was next, then Jim, all landing on top of Chris, wedging him deeper between the two massive ice sheets. Though Jim had an extremely painful injured shoulder and he was in a position that was only 18 inches wide, he was able to move enough to push the sled off of Chris. He found that Chris was wedged, facing away with his head down and his left arm trapped by his side. Jim grabbed Chris's hand and asked if he could feel it. He couldn't. At this, Chris began panicking, pleading for Jim to get him out. Jim reassured Chris that he would. But at this point, Jim was still wearing snowshoes and didn't even know if he could get himself out. The process of changing from snowshoes to crampons in such a tight space was agonizingly slow. To compound the problems, if Jim were to slip and slide deeper into the crevasse, he would also become stuck and they would both die. So Jim had to be extremely cautious in his movements. After he attached the crampon, he attempted to use his ice axe, but it was useless. The pick was so long and the walls were so narrow that he couldn't swing the axe. He had to figure out a different way out. Jim was able to find a foothold and pull on Chris, but he didn't budge. Jim was going to have to get a rope from the sled, climb to the top and try from there. Jim retrieved a rope from the sled and tied one end around his waist and the other end around Chris's backpack. The backpack was the only thing that Jim could get a hold of, and the backpack was also wedged between the two ice sheets. Jim believed that if he could get the backpack out, then Chris would come with it. When Jim attempted to climb out, there wasn't enough room to swing his leg hard enough for the crampons to penetrate the ice. So he carved out small ledges only about an inch wide just wide enough for the front two prongs of the crampons to rest. He pressed his back against one wall and slowly carved out one inch ledges on the other wall as he slowly began to climb. At this point, it was very apparent that something was wrong. He had full strength in both hands, but could not raise one of his arms. It was later found out that he had a broken shoulder. His arm was completely useless. Carving the ledges for a foothold and climbing the 25 feet to the surface with a broken shoulder using one arm with an ice hammer to pull himself up with his foot on one inch ledges was accomplished in approximately 45 minutes to an hour as estimated by Jim. The entire time Chris was calling out, he wasn't panicking now, he was mad. He was mad that he was in this situation and that there was nothing that he could do. He was stuck and couldn't get himself out. He was completely relying on Jim to save him. This frightened and angered Chris. Jim pulled himself out of the crevasse and laid down on the glacier, staring at the sky. It was quiet and peaceful. It became immediately apparent that they were in one of the most remote locations in the world and that their survival was totally up to him. Jim stood up and pulled the rope as hard as he could. He pulled and pulled, but Chris didn't budge. No movement at all. Jim secured a pick in the ice and fixed a rope to the pick, then descended back into the crevasse to get Chris. Chris's backpack was stuck between the walls above Chris just as much as Chris was stuck below. Jim used his axe to try and tear a hole in the pack in an attempt to remove its contents, but it was no use. He straddled Chris and used all his leg power to pull up. Nothing. At this point, Jim knew that he couldn't get Chris out on his own. He went back to the surface and attempted calling for help using their radio. This was a line-of-sight radio in the middle of nowhere. 
Realistically, the only way anyone would hear them is if someone was out looking for them and no one was expecting them back for two weeks. The odds of anyone responding were near zero, but he had to try. Over and over again, he called out over the radio waves, but only heard static in return. Knowing that he couldn't pull Chris out, Jim descended back into the crevasse and tried again, until they both accepted that it was no use. Chris was not getting out. A conversation began. What should Jim say to Chris's family? What should they do with Chris's body? During the conversation, Chris became worried that Jim would fall into a crevasse while trying to get back to civilization and that no one would know what happened to him. He made Jim promise not to try and get out on his own. Jim agreed. Chris accepted his fate and simply asked Jim to take his mouthpiece from his trumpet and leave it on the summit of Everest during the Everest expedition. During their long conversation, Chris began shaking and slurring his words. He was becoming hypothermic. Chris knew that he was going to die and told Jim to go back to the surface and save himself. They said their goodbyes and Jim ascended out of the crevasse. Jim curled up into his bivouac sack and listened as Chris was dying below. Late in the night, Chris sang an old school song, bringing a level of peace to the situation. At around one or two o'clock in the morning, Jim heard Chris for the last time. He and Chris had made arrangements with Doug Geating, a local pilot, to fly over and check on them every few days. But there was no set schedule. Jim decided that his broken shoulder and the crevasses scattered across the glacier, and to honor his word to Chris, that he would wait for Doug to fly over and try to radio him. After five days of eating beef jerky from his pocket and waiting for the sound of the aircraft that had not yet arrived, Jim could wait no longer. Before Jim set out looking for help, he would have to return to the sled to get more supplies. He descended to the sled and was able to get jam, crackers, and honey. Knowing that Jim was doing the right thing by leaving, he also felt extreme shame as he was breaking his promise to Chris. So before he left, he wedged a picket into the side of the crevasse with a note telling anyone that might find it what had happened. He then sat across the glacier on his hands and knees, probing the snow in front of him, checking for other crevasses. Jim got back to the top of the glacier, where he and Chris had been just five days earlier. He was setting up his bivy sack when his foot fell through the snow. He turned and threw his body on the ground, catching himself just before he fell in. Jim set up his bivy sack on solid ground to camp for the night. He had no sooner laid down to rest when a roaring avalanche came down the Wickersham Wall. Luckily, a large crevasse was on the wall above Jim and caught the snow before it reached him. The wind blast blew Jim so hard that his camp slid across the glacier. Over the next few days, Jim continued to make his way up the mountain. The climbing process during the day was extremely slow and hazardous. Jim would crawl out 100 to 150 yards, probing the snow, finding a path between crevasses. He would then return and gather his supplies and trek the route that he had found. Then he would repeat. He found that this was the safest way to travel across the glacier. After painstakingly traveling across the glacier and again almost falling into a crevasse while attempting to make an SOS sign, he finally made it out of this crevasse zone and had a free climb to Cahiltna Pass. This is when the storm hit. A blizzard blew in and pinned Jim down for four days with nothing more than a bivy sack to keep him warm. When the storm cleared, it was Friday, May 22nd. Jim had been surviving on the glacier with little food and shelter alone with a broken shoulder now for two weeks since Chris had passed. He was 1,500 feet below Cahiltna Pass when he heard the sound of an airplane in the distance. He clicked on his radio and it was Doug Geating out looking for Jim and Chris. After Jim explained what had happened, Doug performed an extremely dangerous landing on Peters Glacier and picked up Jim. The next day, Jim traveled to Boston to tell Chris's family the story. Not only did Jim have to tell the story to Chris's family, but he also had to explain everything that he had done to try and save their son's life. Chris's father was also a climber and understood the position that Jim was in. At the wishes of Chris's father, a recovery party flew into the accident site by helicopter and retrieved Chris's body. It took multiple people five hours of chipping ice away to free his body. They later filed an accident report that stated that not only could Jim, in his injured state, not have saved Chris, it was their opinion that no one in a healthy state 
alone could have saved him. This gave Jim at least some closure that he had done everything he possibly could to save Chris, though he lives with guilt to this day. His greatest regret not being that he couldn't save Chris, but they went into the crevasse in the first place. He truly believes that the accident was preventable. This is True Mysteries. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.